over the last two decades, Japanese whiskey has taken the world by storm, winning top awards and sending prices skyrocketing. But how did this once little known spirit become a global phenomenon? Welcome to Kanpai Planet, I'm Mac, taking you on a journey through the rise of Japanese whiskey. Japanese whiskey has a relatively short history. The first commercial distillery, Yamazaki, was established in 1923 by Shinjiro Tori, founder of the company now called Suntory, who wanted to create authentic whiskey. Tori hired Masataka Takatsuru, who had apprenticed at distilleries in Scotland, to be Yamazaki's first distillery manager. Together, they released the first authentic Japanese whiskey, Shirofuda, in 1929, which met with limited success. Fast forward through the rest of the 20th century, during this time, Japanese whiskey was primarily a domestic product that had little exposure outside the country. Despite some solid product placement and brand name Gaijin featuring regularly in adverts for whiskey. Centauri. Like scotch, it was primarily blended. The first widely available Japanese single malt was released in 1984. A common phrase one hears is that Japanese whiskey was a well kept secret. If that's the case, it was a secret that was being kept tighter and tighter year by year. Whiskey consumption dropped from an estimated 350 megalitres in 1983 to 74 megalitres in 2007. So, what changed? In February 2001, Whiskey Magazine held its first ever blind tasting competition. 293 products were submitted from around the world and judged by 62 experts in Edinburgh, Kentucky, and Japan. It was won by a Yawichi 10 single cask from Nika Whiskey. That same year, Mercian's Karawizawa Pure Malt 12-year-old picked up gold at the International Wine and Spirits Competition in London. And so, global recognition of Japanese whiskey began, and since then, it hasn't looked back. The awards kept coming, signaling that Japanese whiskey was a serious contender on the international stage. Rather like the use of foreign celebrities in adverts, that overseas validation continues to drive domestic attention to Japanese whiskey. It certainly didn't hurt that in 2003, Suntory's Hibiki 17 made a prime appearance in Sofia Coppola's Japan set film, Lost in Translation, starring Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson. The infamous scene is in part a homage to Sophia's father, Francis Ford Coppola's attempts to shill Japanese whiskey. To this day, this remains the most successful product placement of any Japanese whiskey, and a factor in why, 15 years after the film was released, Hibiki 17 was discontinued by Suntory due to outsized demand and lack of supply. For relaxing times, make it Suntory time. If you can get hold of it, that is. In 2007, the non jata website was founded by Chris Bunting. Soon after, Tokyo Whiskey Hub was founded by Stefan Van Eiken. These projects merged and non jata became the premier home for information about Japanese whiskey until 2017, which was around the time that Liam McNulty, aka Whiskey Richard, took up the mantle with his blog, Nomunication, and in 2021, Kanpai Planet, a YouTube channel and content platform bringing you the world of Japan's drinks direct from the heart of Tokyo, was founded. A number of books about Japanese whiskey have also been released in non-Japanese languages, including the definitive Whiskey Rising by Stefan Van Eiken. All this has meant up-to-date, direct-from-source information about Japanese whiskey has been out there, amplifying interest and fueling demand. 
In April 2008, Suntory launched what turned out to be one of the most successful ad campaigns in global drinks history, focused on the highball, the whiskey, soda and rocks classic served in beer mugs, possibly the most successful serving suggestion since cornflakes and milk. Specifically, they pushed the kakuhai, made from Suntory whiskey kakubin. Cleaner and lighter than beer, the highball gave consumers a refreshing alternative and restaurants higher profit margins. What's not to love? It wasn't just an on-trade success. Sales of ready-to-drink canned highballs jumped from 38,000 cases in 2009 to 6.3 million in 2010. This campaign's importance cannot be overstated. It kept the Japanese whiskey industry alive. And the highball boom didn't just impact sales of Kakobin, it had a knock-on effect on other brands. And to this day, the highball is the most common way to consume whiskey in Japan. Around the same time as Suntory were launching the highball renaissance, Ichiro Akuto was distilling his first liquid at the Chichibu distillery. Modern Japanese craft whiskey begins here in February 2008, at a time when the industry was at rock bottom. The continuing interest in craft drinks, small batch production, and more recently terroir has played a factor in the rise of Japanese whiskey. As consumers have become more knowledgeable about the drinks they were consuming, they've begun to seek out products that were made, or they perceive to be made, with care and attention. And speaking of which... In 2009, Foreign Policy published an article praising Japan's gross national cool. Of course, it didn't begin there. Post the Meiji Revolution, Japan's soft power has been rising, with ideas from Zen Buddhism, to the KonMari system, exported to a world that regards Japan as quirky, fascinating, and exotic. It's become a soft power superpower, with the country's pop culture and cuisine joining its long esteemed electronics and cars. Hence the perception of Japan as a country that is stylish, sophisticated, and innovative, which it is, as long as you don't mind being asked to fax your bank before 3 p.m. Japan's reputation for fostering craftsmanship and consistency has helped position its whiskey as a premium product, distinct from its competitors in the Anglosphere, creating a demand that extends beyond just whiskey enthusiasts to those who are interested more broadly in Japan and its culture. Producers, especially Suntory, have been more than happy to play on that. Japan's tourism boom has been a huge factor in the rising demand for Japanese whiskey. The number of visitors to Japan increased from 6.2 million in 2011 to a record 31.9 million in 2019. As the number of visitors to Japan has increased, so has the number of people finding themselves with the opportunity to try the now famous spirit. Many tourists are now adding distillery tours and whiskey tastings, as well as liquid souvenir shopping, to their itineraries, which has helped to raise the profile of Japanese whiskey even further. Plus, a bottle of whiskey provides more bang for weight than a bottle of sake. On the 29th of September 2014, NHK broadcast the first episode of Masan, a morning drama based on the true story of Masataka Taketsuru, the godfather of Japanese whiskey, and founder of Nika and his Scottish wife, Rita Cohen. The six month long drama helped shift the perception of whiskey in Japan from a hard to appreciate Western tipple to something distinctly Japanese. And just as importantly, something for everyone. Over 20, of course. 20% of the population of Japan watched Masan and sales at Nika jumped 124% in 2014. A year later, Nika announced the cessation of all their age statement single malts due to lack of supply. Nuff said. It was only in 2022 that Nika returned, albeit in limited allocation, an age statement single malt to shelves. Suntory faced the same supply demand imbalance and placed their age statements 
on strict allocation, which ended up amplifying demand even more. The 2010s brought with them new craft whiskey distilleries in Scotland, Ireland and the US. And that movement finally came to Japan in the middle of the decade with the founding of distilleries such as Akeshi, Asaka, Shizuoka and Kanosuke. In a typical market, when limited supply meets excess demand, you're going to get new entrants. We've gone from nine distilleries in 2013 to over 60 in 2023, and that number is rising every month. Almost all these distilleries are tiny, so the volume of liquid produced hasn't jumped as much as that headline might imply. So rather than solving the supply demand equation, this has exacerbated it. There are now even more hyper limited products that everybody wants to get their hands on. Even the Chichibu distillery, which has been operating for over 15 years now, has yet to release a single malt with a bottle count over 12,000, preferring instead to drop a plethora of single casks. Great for investors and collectors, but perhaps less so for drinkers. Everything we've discussed so far has been compounded by a number of global trends. Accelerating information flow, social media's explosion, the growth in online sales, and easier and cheaper international shipping, the proliferation of world whiskey, rising income levels in many countries, and the broadening popularity of brown liquor. All that brings us to today, where Japanese whiskey is some of the most desirable in the world. While the product is relatively expensive compared to other whiskies, this hasn't deterred enthusiasts from seeking out rare bottlings and limited editions. In fact, this has helped propel its rise. Japanese whiskey is a Veblen good. Sound familiar? This mystique is amplified by the revered status that lost distilleries like Karuizawa and Hanyu have achieved. Their remaining stock has been selectively released over time, sometimes at eye-watering prices. Who would want to miss out on the next potential hit? This creates hype, FOMO, and an FYGM attitude when you finally snag a bottle of unobtainium. Arguably, even beyond that of other cult brands such as Springbank and Pappy Van Winkle. 2020 saw exports of Japanese whiskey worth 27.1 billion yen, 16 times the value of a decade ago. It was the year that whiskey became Japan's leading alcohol export, overtaking sake. While the industry still faces challenges like labeling trust issues and a shortage of aged stock, the future of Japanese whiskey is brighter than ever. Until next time, kanpai.